Hello, and welcome to Chapter Book Storytime. I'm Ellen, and I work at EVPL Oakland Library. On today's edition of the Variety Pack, I have two books that have similar themes. And the funny thing is, I didn't realize it until I started reading them. They both have the theme of exploration of the unknown. One book takes place in outer space, and the other on Earth. So why don't we get started? The first book I'm going to talk to you about is part of a series, and it's also based on a podcast, an award-winning podcast called The Unexplainable Disappearance of Mars Patel. It's an award-winning podcast with a script, and the actors are young people. Um, so it's really good, and you might want to take a listen to it sometimes. But out of that podcast came this book series. And the first book in the series is called The Unexplainable Disappearance of Mars Patel, just the same title as the podcast. And the author is Sheila Char Chari. I thought I'd read to you from the book jacket of the first book because I really want to concentrate on the second book. So here is what's going on. Kids are disappearing from H.G. Wells Middle School and the adults don't seem to care. When Mars Patel's friend Aurora goes missing, he and the rest of his detention crew band together to find her. But a talent for practical jokes and avoiding their school's numerous surveillance cameras will only take the friends so far. Kids all over the world are going missing, and it soon becomes clear that the disappearances have something to do with Pruitt Prep the elite school created by tech billionaire Oliver Pruitt, who happens to be the most powerful man in the world and Mars's idol. So that is the basis of the book series. The second book in the series is entitled The Interplanetary Exploration of Mars Patel, also by Sheila Chari. So Mars finds himself on a rocket ship headed for Mars. Let's find out what happens. Mars, say goodbye to Earth. You are about to go on the adventure of your life, crowed Oliver Pruitt, the billionaire inventor who had orchestrated this journey on his own spaceship. Of course, he wasn't actually in the cockpit. Only a hologram version of him stood there. But that didn't stop the man from gushing virtually from his control center millions of miles away. Go on, float around, Oliver called out as Mars turned green. Welcome to zero gravity. Just a few minutes ago, after leaving Earth, Mars had unbuckled his harness and felt himself free-floating free inside the walls of the cockpit, somersaulting and pinwheeling his way through the cabin. First he was right side up, and then he was upside down until his limbs felt like clouds, and the universe zoomed by outside in a veil of darkness. Was this really happening to him? Was he really on a spaceship headed to the planet Mars? Now Mars's friends and his mom were left behind, maybe forever. It had been 12 minutes since liftoff, but to Mars it felt like a lifetime. He needed to know where Aurora was and why Oliver had led him to outer space, far from everyone Mars loved. But first Mars had other problems. He heaved into a paper bag. Oh, I think I just barfed up a lung, he said weakly. Nothing like traveling through space for the first time. What you're feeling, Mars, is motion sickness as your body adjusts to weightlessness. But don't worry. You'll get used to it in no time, and then the fun really begins. The door to the cockpit burst open. Mr. Pruitt, we've got a problem, announced a girl in an orange flight suit who had tumbled into the room. She was small bone with a slightly upturned nose and a cascade of dark brown curls floating around her square face. Mars stared in disbelief. You're lost in London. I mean, you're Julia. He recognized her immediately from the missing children flyers he and his friends had found back in Port Elizabeth. But where had she come from? Had she been on the spacecraft the entire time? When did you get here? He asked. Julia rolled her eyes at him, but her voice was gentle. Mars, I didn't get here. I've been here. But honestly, I don't have time to explain when we're in an emergency. Mr. Pruitt, I need to know if... But hologram Oliver Pruitt was fading away. Julia's eyebrows knitted together. Mr. Pruitt, she repeated crossly. Sorry, Julia, I uh, have to run. But it sounds like you've got it under control. Oliver Pruitt was growing fainter and fainter until he was just a shimmer. 
go, Mars cried out. You need to answer my questions. Where's Aurora? What's going to happen to my friends and my mom? And why did you lie to me? Why did you make us go through all of that on Earth? Oh, that's a lot of questions, Oliver said wryly. I need to know. I had to make sure you were ready for the red planet. Oliver now is barely an outline. Wait until you get here. The colony will blow your mind. Colony? Uh, Mars repeated. Is that where Aurora is? There's so much to tell you, Mars, about why I chose you for the mission. Because you are... The spaceship lurched horribly. Warning! Breach imminent in Sector C. The announcement rang across the speakers, followed by an alarm. Mr. Pruitt! Julia said again more urgently, but Oliver Pruitt had vanished from the cockpit. Oh, great! Just what we need! A commander-in-chief who's MIA! Warning! Breach imminent in Sector C! Is this warning serious? Mars asked nervously. What does it mean? Julia had floated to an intercom mounted on the wall and now said loudly into the mic, We need you on the flight deck! Now! Then she turned to Mars. It means that if we don't do something about the hole in Sector C, we are going to burn up like a marshmallow on an open flame, which is what I was trying to tell Oliver Pruitt before he vanished on us. Warning! Catastrophic breach in Sector C. Catastrophic breach in Sector C. All systems disengage in three minutes. Does this mean we're going to die? Mart felt, Mars felt his heart thud. Until now, it had seemed like things were going well enough. Sure, he thought Pruitt Prep was a normal school on Gale Island until he found out that it was also a spacecraft headed to Mars. And sure, Oliver had tricked him into coming on board, but Mars hadn't expected to die on the man's watch. Now Oliver was gone, and catastrophe was around the corner. It means we have to handle the problem ourselves, Julia said. That means you, Mars. But, but I don't, muttered Mars stuttered in panic. I've never been on a spaceship. I've never... Julia steeled herself. I get it. This is all new for you. It's natural to freak out. But I need you to calm down so you can help us not die. You think you could handle that? Behind Julia, a panel slid open. A teenage guy in a gray suit floated in. His brown eyes were wide-spaced and intelligent, and he looked like he hadn't had a haircut in weeks. Places, everybody, he said easily. These interplanetary space shuttles don't fly themselves. Mars stared at him, agog. Who else was on board this spacecraft? You really took forever, Orion, Julia said. We have less than three minutes. Orion tumbled toward the cockpit and slipped into the pilot's seat. He strapped himself in next to Julia, who was already strapped in and waiting for him. I heard, I heard, he said to her. He inputted some numbers into the control panel. Julia, you handle the throttle. Roger that. Orion turned to Mars. How about you, Butterfly, he said evenly. Butterfly? Wait, wait, who are you? Mars, Orion, Orion, Mars, Julia said, making quick introductions. He's the pilot. Think you can spin us? Orion pointed to a wheel mounted on a con cons console behind him. I guess, Mars said unsurely. That will mean you aren't buckled in, okay? Orion asked. So hold on tight or you're really going to be flying around here like a butterfly. Start turning that wheel now. The wheel was surprisingly heavy. Mars gripped the handle with both hands, breathing hard as he rotated. What does this do? he asked, panting. We're turning this craft manually, Orion explained, his eyes on the flight monitor. I already applied a patch from the service module using a bot. That ought to hold us. Later, when we get to the space station, we'll repair the breach for real. Okay. Mars stopped talking as he concentrated all of his energy on turning the wheel. Orion was right. It was taking everything to hold on so that Mars wouldn't find himself thrown against the walls of the flight tech. Then, a few minutes later, the announcements stop. The lights came on in the room, and the spinning stopped. Mars let go of the wheel and floated gratefully to an open chair. Through the monitors, he could see the spaceship moving forward as Orion finished entering coordinates into the panel. Back on autopilot, Orion said, and on track to reach Pruitt Space Station at expected arrival time. 
Excellent work, Orion, Julia said. Of course, you are the best pilot at Pruitt Prep. Yeah, but you're the one who spotted the breach, Orion stretched back in his chair. Just so that just leaves you, Butterfly. Why are you here again? Why do you keep calling me that, Mars asked. Because you look like one, flying around like somebody's going to eat you. No, I don't. Mars jumped up from his chair so suddenly that the momentum spun him forward into the monitors. He leaned back, rubbing his sore arms. Butterfly, quit calling me that. Oh, bloody stop, both of you, Julia said. She had clearly had enough. Orion, you know who he is. He's Mars Patel. Orion gave a good-natured smile and held his hands up in the universal gesture of backing off. Even though he looked a few years older, it was clear he respected what Julia had to say. Course, I was just messing with him. Just because this is your second trip to Mars, Julia said, doesn't mean you get to ruffle everyone's feathers. I gotcha, Orion said. Behind Julia, Mars noticed something strange with one of the monitors. Hey, why is it dark in the cargo hold? Is everything okay? Did something break while we were spinning? Orion's smile faded. Nope, it's dark for a reason, Butterfly. Stay out. Why? Maybe you should check. Orion stood up quickly, his feet catapulting him off the ground. I said, stay out. It's some special delivery Mr. Pruitt put Orion in charge of, Julia said to Mars. Even I don't know what it is, but boy, does Orion get his shorts bunched up over it. Why does everything have to be so secretive around here? Mars grumbled. Listen, butterfly breath, Orion said, this ain't no H.G. Wells Middle School. Yeah, Julie and me know all about you and your friends back home. If you guys don't like something, you just break the rules and go to detention. Well, that's not how it works here. You mess up, you die. I think I can take care of myself, Mars said hotly. He decided to ignore the fact that just a few minutes ago, he had been clutching a barf bag. Mars, Orion is right, Julia said gravely. This is a dangerous place. Remember what just happened. You mean the breach, Mars said. I thought that was an accident, and we fixed it. Julia and Orion glanced at each other. A whole unspoken conversation seemed to flow between them. That breach was no accident, Orion said ominously. That was sabotage. Chapter 2 jumps ahead six months, and the spaceship is still on its way to Mars. After that excitement at the beginning with the emergency in Sector C, um, things have become pretty calm, and Mars is getting used to the day-to-day -day routine. Uh, in the morning, he has flight training. He learns about the spaceship. He even helps with some of the scientific experiments taking place on board. And he eats meals with Julia and Orion, and they're getting to be very good friends. One day, Mars asks... Why are you here? For Julia, it was a chance to do something new. First, I was looking for the missing kids, Julia said, referring to the hundreds of children who had gone missing around the world, who were actually at Pruitt Prep, until I found out where they were. After that, it was seriously boring being in my flat in East London. It's not like I've got a trove of kids like me to converse with. And I love my parents, but they own a hardware store. How long can I talk about lug nuts and home repair? Me? I got nothing else better going on, Orion said. This is way cooler. Mars asked him if he missed his family. I am my family, was his reply. Well, you guys had a choice, Mars said. I'm just sort of here. That wasn't true. He had a choice, and the choice had been to protect his friends and find Aurora. But Mars didn't know then that his choice would include going on some kind of interplanetary expedition. Maybe butterflies just go where the wind takes them, Orion said, grinning. That was the other thing, the teasing, but it was different here. Here, everyone looked out for one another. Still, when Mars remembered his home, he would catch his breath. How was his mom? How would she manage without him? How he could still hear his, her voice over the phone when he'd said goodbye to her from Pruitt Prep back on Earth. I always knew you'd have a great destiny, she had told him, her voice cracking. Did she know what his destiny really was? To fly to Mars? He'd left her behind and all his friends, Caddy, Toothpick, JP, Jonas. Were they happier without him? 
or had he managed to destroy their lives too? All those weeks of detention, the suspensions from school, and not to mention being social delinquents, that was all his fault too. The only thing that, Mars gave, that gave Mars hope was finding Aurora. At least his other friends were safe at home with their families. But who was looking out for her? Her dad was never around and neither was her mom. What if Aurora had gone on this mission with Oliver Pruitt because she was desperate? Because she didn't have a choice? Or what if Oliver had taken her away for some other reason? So many secrets. Oliver Pruitt might be the most untrustworthy human being in the universe. And yet, here Mars was, traveling in a rocket ship to meet him. It kind of blew his mind. Mars has been trying to get in touch with Aurora by phone. There is a phone that can be used to get in, in contact with people on the colony of Mars. But so far, he hasn't got an answer. Um, at one time, he says, Aurora, it's pretty wild in space. Did I tell you I have two crewmates? Julia is super smart, like toothpick, time one, times 100. Orion is a really good pilot. They probably think I'm a dork. Right back. Still no answer. But then today, he gives her the most important text. Aurora, landing on Mars in 24 hours. See you soon, I hope. As soon as Mars finishes that text, a pinging sound echoes across the room. Uh-oh, Orion said. We know what that means. There was a flash of light and Oliver Pruitt's hologram materialized in front of them. Today, he was wearing his customary white space suit, and he had a five o'clock shadow on his chin, as well as visible circles under his eyes. Could it be that Oliver Pruitt was actually tired? Greetings, my cosmic friends, he called out. I have been burning the midnight oil in anticipation of your arrival. And he has surprising news, too. They're not going to be landing on Mars in 24 hours. They are going to be landing in one hour and it's time to get ready. Sir, that's 20 hours ahead of schedule, Julia said. Are you certain? We're docking already? Mars looked from one face to another. Affirmative, Oliver said. That's because I increased your spacecraft speed remotely. We've been experiencing uh, interference. Better you arrive before anyone else knows. Is it the Martians? Orion asked. Are they giving you trouble? Oliver's smile was steady. Yes, but we don't let setbacks slow down progress. Martians, Mars asked. You mean little slimy green aliens with red eyes? No, butterfly, Orion said. Mr. Pruitt's talking about a small group of colonists giving him grief. They call themselves the Martians, and they're a royal pain, Julia said. Who do you think sabotaged us six months ago when you first came on board? She stopped as if she had said too much. That's what the breach was? Mars asked. Why didn't you tell me about the Martians? I mean, colonists. What's so secret about them? Some of the colonists, Oliver corrected. But listen, that's not important. I'm here to tell you to secure the spacecraft, get into position, and prepare for your arrival at Pruitt Station. You will be docking in the main area, then transferring to an Oliver shuttle. An Oliver shuttle, Mars repeated. It sounded like one of those rides at Six Flags. That's right, just a short ride and you'll be on Mars. Mars on Mars, Orion said, grinning. Oliver Pruitt's hologram shimmered. We're all very excited. Roger that, Julia said. We're excited too, sir. We will be ready. Oh, and one last thing, friends, Oliver said. Keep this information about your arrival to yourselves. We don't want any trouble, understood? You can count on us, Orion said. What about that special delivery in the cargo hold? Oliver's eyes flicked momentarily to Mars. Continued as planned, Orion. And remember, no one is allowed in the cargo hold. And this time his eyes rested plainly on Mars. Mars stared back, feeling rankled. There it was again, secrets. After all that had happened, why was no one being straight with him? What was so important in the cargo hold? Arver, Oliver Pruitt gave a swift salute. To the stars! To the stars, Orion and Julia said at the same time. Yeah, right, Mars muttered. There was another ping, and Oliver's hologram shut off. After all that had happened, after all the awful things Oliver Pruitt had done to him, 
humiliating him in front of his entire school, kidnapping his friends, oh, and oh yeah, forcing him to ditch everyone on Earth for this mission. Mars was still excited. He had been training for months with Julia and Orion. It had taken him weeks to figure out how to lock on the helmet and gloves. Mostly, he couldn't believe he would be landing at the space station and heading off from there to Mars, where he would meet Oliver Pruitt. A jerk, yeah, but still a pretty famous jerk. And finally, find Aurora. As Mars was throwing away his food items, he heard an unfamiliar buzz in his pocket. It was coming from his IP phone. He pulled it out quickly. Was it Aurora, finally? So far, she had never answered any of his texts. Mars's pulse quickened as he clicked the envelope icon on the screen. But it was not from Aurora. It was from someone he didn't know. With a warning. Server interplanetary. From anonymous to this is Mars. Mars, we know about your arrival. You are in big danger. We'll find you, so don't bother hiding. Don't tell anyone you got this message, or it's bye-bye, Julia and Orion. So many secrets, so many questions. Who is this Oliver Pruitt guy? Is he a good guy, bad guy, or just a jerk like Mars thinks? What is in the cargo hold and why doesn't anyone want to let Mars know what it is? What's the big secret? Where's Aurora? Will Mars find her in the colonies? And why do some of the colonists want to sabotage this mission to Mars? This is a science fiction mystery with lots of adventure built in, an exploration of the unknown. The series is called The Unexplainable Disappearance of Mars Patel by Sheila Chari, based on a podcast of the same title. And then the second book in the series is The Interplanetary Expedition of Mars Patel by Sheila Chari, a great series with lots of adventure and mystery. Our next book with the theme of exploration is North Wind by Gary Paulson. Now I know a few weeks ago I read a book called How to Train Your Dad, which was a very humorous story by Gary Paulson, but this is a type of novel, North Wind is the type of novel that we think of more when we think of a Gary Paulson novel. He writes a lot of books about the wilderness and survival and exploration of the wilderness, and that's what this book is. When Gary Paulson was a young boy, he used to listen to his grandmother's tales of Norse mythology. She was from Norway, and, she, and Gary loved to listen to those stories. And Gary also spent a lot of time uh, on the water, on the sea, learning how to sail, and those are some of his most precious memories. And so he decided that he would write this adventure story of the wilderness. Uh, Gary Paulson passed away in 2021, so this is one of our last books by Gary Paulson. And so I wanted to highlight it because it really is a very good story. This is a tale of Leaf, a young orphan boy named Leaf. And Paulson wants to give it the feel of an ancient tale, a saga, or an epic story about a brave hero. Um, you can see in the beginning, in the introduction, he has what he calls the saga of, a sea, of the sea child, meaning a a story of heroic deeds, an epic tale. And he even, in the, the print that is used, looks like ancient runes, and you see these symbols, ancient Norse runes, as if to make this seem like a very ancient tale that happened centuries ago. The Saga of the Sea Child. And it came to pass he was born of a woman of the sea, born of a sea woman, with a blood clot held tightly in his fist, a sign. A sign to tell, to tell of hardship and danger in the life to come, to come from the tiny fist and clot, and the mother of no remembered name did die birthing the boy, and the father, also of no remembered name, had passed to Valhalla fighting a whale. As there was no other named family, the boy was born an orphan, alone, to live alone on the docks, a dock boy. A wharf boy, nursed by sucking rags dipped in sour goat's milk and fish oil, that on scraps others would chew to soften, dressed in yet more rags with crudely carven wooden shoes, always half naked. He was that boy, that boy. And they called him the wharf rat and named him Leaf, for no other person on those docks had that name. 
And when he was old enough to walk, they took him on the boats. For all his young life, he was passed from one boat to the next, to the next, to the next. No longer the wharf rat named Leaf, but a boat rat named Leaf. And when he could use his hands, they set him to repairing nets, sewing ripped nets, torn clothing, and sharpening the seal-killing harpoons, beating him with wooden rods if he did them wrong. And they made him cook greasy eel meat that the sailors would eat. For 12 years, Leif lived pretty much like a servant on these ships, helping the sailors and the seal hunters. On his 12th year, in his 12th summer, he... Leif, another young boy named Little Carl, and four older, weaker men who weren't able to go seal hunting were dropped off on an island. They were to go salmon fishing, uh, catch as much salmon as they could, smoke it, and preserve it for the winter. It was while they were on that island that Leif's life changed. And they waited for days upon days, and the ship, the seal hunting ship, did not return for them, would never return for them. For this was a bad coast with terrible ripping tides and unpredictable winds and rocky points where death was always waiting. And this they knew and so came to know there would be no ship coming back for them and that the ship and crew were gone to Valhalla. Valhalla is, in Norse mythology, is a great dining hall where all the brave warriors who die in battle all the brave fishermen go uh, to spend eternity. And they were alone. And they would have to leave this place by way of the sea. They had a small canoe, which they had used axes to carve from a cedar log for working in the stream spearing salmon. But they were too many for so small a craft, and it was decided that they should make a large dugout canoe to take them all, and had cut down a giant tree to roll drag into camp. And they would have done this, could have done this, except death found them. Death came to the island. Men came to the island carrying disease. They were very sick, and they infected the people in the fishing camp. And as one by one the old men started dying, one particular old man named Old Carl, who hadn't got sick yet, saw what was happening. So he took Leif and little Carl, put them in the small canoe, gave them supplies and food, and said to Leif, paddle north, go north, whatever you do, get away from the sickness. And so that's what Leif did. He paddled north, didn't know where he was going, didn't know what would happen, but he paddled north at 12 years old. What an adventure. Unfortunately, along the way, little Carl did get sick and he died. So now Leif is completely alone on the water heading north. Leif had never been alone before. He had always been with other sailors. Now he's in a canoe, learning to paddle, learning to navigate unknown territory, and learning how to survive. He begins to have a certain routine to his day. Uh, for several days, he will paddle, keep paddling north um, along and uh, seeing dolphin and whale and raven and crows. And every once in a while, he would stop at an inlet where he can fish for salmon and smoke it for, the, for another journey, uh, gather blackberries to eat, uh, and that's where he has some encounters with bears, some adventures with bears. And as he goes along, he's learning. He's learning how to survive in the wilderness. He makes some mistakes, uh, what we might call rookie mistakes or beginner's mistakes, but he survives and he keeps paddling north and seeing wondrous things along the way. Here's one chapter, one of my favorites, where he has a great adventure. It's called Dancing Giants. And now the country changed as he had changed. For a slogging period of days, the whole business of inlets disappeared and he was forced to paddle directly northwest up a long channel. There were nearly no side places to long stop and rest. And when he finally had to just flat quit in exhaustion, all he had available were thick brush and stunted trees that grew out of the side of the rock faces to tie the canoe off to hang and rest. No matter how his arms ached, it was still better than his life had been on the ships. He had kept going another day and one more sleep, and the next time he awakened, he sat up in the canoe and looked ahead into thick fog. 
It was not something new, fog, and he disliked it for the way it blocked his vision. He began to paddle, pointing ahead northwest up into the narrow channel, and felt the tidal current pick him up and carrying him along. He could see almost nothing, barely visualized what was directly in front of the canoe. But he sensed a change in the water around him, felt the channel widening and the current that was pushing him slack off, with the water becoming more spread out. He could hear the birds, squawking gulls, gurgling ravens overhead, thinking they must be above the fog, or, more wondering, would they fly in fog as thick as this? Could the fog be that shallow in depth? And now he heard a new sound that made no sense at all. Huge splashing! as if something enormous was getting dropped or thrown down on the water. Out there, in the fog, where he couldn't see. Something it se sometimes it seemed close, or again very muffled, as if farther off. And then nothing for a time. And more, two, three times, explosions of water sound, with no order or rhythm. Quiet, and then whoosh, bang! Again, and then it was gone. He had quit piling. <clears throat> he had quit paddling, but when the water thunder, as he thought of it, seemed to have stopped, he started up again, and had gone a while in the fog, stroking evenly straight ahead, trying to push his eyes through the gray blank wall in front of him. When suddenly, as if passing through a thick veil, he came out of the fog. He had just two moments to see what lay before him. He had come out into a large bay surrounded by islands and the mainland on the east, so it made an enormous circle of calm water. And it was filled, absolutely filled, with whales. They, there were spouts everywhere, one after another, and whales, not just killer whales, but true giants of the sea, leaping up into the air and falling back with a large thunder crash of water. Then, directly in front of the canoe, the very ocean seemed to swell, pushed up from beneath, and first the nose, and then the whole front half of a giant whale exploded up, towering over the canoe and leaf for an instant, and then slammed down and over to the side in an explosion of water and noise that seemed to engulf the whole canoe. If it had come down on me, we never would have come up. Leaf couldn't believe, believe the canoe was still floating. So the whale came up out of the water, over the canoe, and down into the water on the other side. Leaf couldn't believe the canoe was still floating. The pressure wave from the falling whale plowed into the side of the small boat, drove it sideways, skidding on the water like a chip of wood. He had no control. He had the opposite of control because everything he tried to do turned out to be wrong. In the thick fog, paddling as best as he could in a straight line, without realizing it, it, he came out well out into the bay. He had heard the jumping whales around him, but had seen nothing. And now, now he could see everything. So that was the sound, the whoosh and the bang that he had heard in the fog. And what he saw came close to terrifying him. He was smack in the middle of what seemed to be an Odin-inspired gathering of true giants, and he suddenly remembered old Carl, watching little Carl trying to keep up and getting brushed aside with men at work, saying, When oxen dance in the barnyard, mice hide in their holes. And now Leaf was the smallest of mice in a massive barnyard. In the fog, he had propelled himself out into the very center of all that was happen happening, a frenzy of whales. Of course, he had seen killer whales, orcas very close. He had touched one, made eye contact, and had seen giant whales before while he was captive on the ships, but always at a great distance. Vapor spouts far away, now and then a set of flukes when a whale, whale dove again, but never close. A brief flash of something black and shiny and wet off in the distance, and then they were gone. They always seemed to be trying to avoid the ships, always dove deep or turned away. Never like this. They weren't avoiding anything, couldn't care less about a boy in a canoe, and he realized suddenly what they were doing. They were being whales. This was how they lived. And if I live, he thought, I will have gotten to see this. At the moment, he wasn't quite sure he would be able to pull it off. The whales that were jumping, 
he had come to believe that they were dancing, were mostly gray whales. And when they came up, apparently from the bottom somewhere to get a good run at it, they blew out of the water so hard it seemed as if they were trying to fly. But of course they couldn't. They had to come back down. And they just as apparently had not had a usable plan on anything but just to leap up. They fell back wherever, however, and Leaf knew that if he happened to be under one when it landed, he would simply disappear. The end. The trick was he didn't know how to avoid the jumpers. Since they didn't seem to have any coherent idea, they just jumped wherever they happened to get the urge, or so it seemed, it was impossible tr to try to paddle the canoe in such a way as to avoid them. There were also humpbacks, whose backs curved when they dove, so, so that often their flukes rarely showed, and blue whales so huge they would make two or even three grays. All of them, the humpbacks and blues, seemed to blanket the bay in a roiling, heaving mass that made the surface come alive with their backs. It was the way they fed that made things tricky. A blue whale, which was longer than any ship Leaf had sailed upon, would dive straight down, swim in a tight circle emitting bubbles so that it generated a circular tube-shaped bubble container, then deftly dive again, curve tightly up, open its wide gaping mouth, and blow to the surface filling its mouth with seawater and any small fish or sea creatures unlucky enough to have been caught and trapped in the bubble-walled bubble cage. At the top of this feeding procedure, the front end of the whale's mouth would jam out of the surface and he would slam it shut and squeeze out all the water which had been captured in his giant pleated belly in a spray through what appeared to be a thick fan of dark hair bristles, which let the water through but retained any food. When he saw it for the first time, Leaf thought it was a great way to eat. Take it all and spit out what you didn't want. He had part of an instant to realize he and the entire canoe were sitting inside a surfacing ring of popping bubbles when the water around him detonated and a huge head of a blue whale emerged, brutally plowing the canoe sideways, nearly rolling it, and he was covered with the water that the whale expelled out into the air. The blue whale could not have cared less for Leaf and the canoe, did not even seem to consider them. He was there to eat, period. And from that point on, the canoe and Leaf were simply something to get out of the way. And Leaf became most definitely the mouse in a barnyard full of dancing oxen. No matter what he did, no matter what direction he moved, it was wrong. He tried first, as soon as he regained control of his abilities and realized he had not been swallowed by the gigantic mouth that came up beneath him, to paddle away from the blue whale, which was now sinking away to get ready for another go at it only to find out that he was on top of another ring of bubbles and had to grab the sides of the canoe and use his knees to keep balanced to avoid being, being rolled up and over and out of the way. Trying and failing to keep calm, he took to the paddle once more and tried to maneuver away, only to find himself yet again in the wrong place as a giant mouth exploded up under him. Back and forth, to and fro, spin and jerk, until somehow he found himself flattened against the shore hanging on desperately to a dead tree limb that stuck out from a rock without having the slightest idea of how he and the canoe got there. Crawling along the shore, he came to a small inlet, really little more than a dent in the side of the shoreline, and turned in. There was a little circular pan of gravel and rock. He could see no bear scat, and he pulled the canoe up, turned it over to dry out, and made a camp near a trickling brook that came out of the rock and forest above him. All this took no time or thought. It was becoming nearly automatic for him. Quick fire circle of rocks, a mouse nest to make a spark, and to make a fire, and to make. All of it without thinking. Wherever he was now became his home, was as familiar as if he had designed the things for himself, had put this firewood just here, put this mouse nest just there. Of course, there were life surprises that were not always good, like a sickness that killed, or a whirlpool to suck you down, or a surprise of coming out of thick fog into a frenzy of jumping and feeding whales without a warning. But you faced those things as they came, and either were successful, or you went to Valhalla. That simple. You lived, or you died. And in between the two, if you kept your mind open and aware, and listened, and smelled, and watched, in between, you learned, and Leif has learned a lot on his journey, his adventure in the wilderness as he travels north.
This is North Wind by Gary Paulson. It's available at EVPL in print and also as an e-audiobook to listen to. Our other books today, the series, the Mars Patel series, are available in print at several EVPL locations. That's it for another edition of Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. I hope you enjoyed our stories today, and I'm really glad you joined me. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.